एक समय था जब गरीबी से लड़ने की जरूरत थी अब वो समय आया है जब सांप्रदायिकता से लड़ने की जरूरत है स्ट्रगल अगेंस्ट कम्युनिज्म कैन बी प्रॉपरली वेज बाय यंग पीपल लाइक यू इफ यू कॉन्स्टेंटली इंटरेक्ट विद योर विद पीपल हु आर अराउंड यू पीपल आर हैविंग सो मच ऑफ मिथ्स रिगार्डिंग मुस्लिम कम्युनिटी हमारे खेलों तक पे असर देखने को मिलता है अपने निजी स्वार्थों के लिए निजी लाभ के लिए वो पूरे शहर का पूरे समाज का माहौल बिल्कुल खराब कर देता है आई रिफ्यूज टू बिलीव दैट अ मेजॉरिटी ऑफ योर मीडिया इज स्प्रेडिंग हेट और प्रेजुडिस आपस में इस तरह की चीजें चलती रहे समाज बटा रहे उनको रोटियां सीखने का जो मौका मिलता रहे जनरली द पीपल हु परपेचुएट दीस क्राइम्स दे गेट अवे विदाउट गेटिंग एनी पनिशमेंट सपोज सच अ कार्नेज ब्रेक्स आउट अराउंड यू व्हाट आर यू गोइंग टू डू डोंट फॉरगेट अफगानिस्तान डोंट फॉरगेट तालिबान डोंट फॉरगेट दैट दीस आर द कॉन्सिक्वेंसेस ऑफ ग्रेट इंटरनल स्ट्राइफ प्रोड्यूस्ड बाय द सेम फैक्टर्स एट वर्क इन आवर पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड Don't forget that. Fascism in India will not come in the form in which it has come in Europe. Fascism in India will come in the form of communism. Even if not in the short run, I'm quite optimistic in the long run it will be defeated. It has to be defeated because it cannot survive because history has not been shaped like this. And history will come to the rescue of the future of a great nation like India. after the british had conquered uh, india through a whole series uh, of uh, uh, wars and other uh, policy mechanisms in from the middle of the 18th century till the middle of the 19th century in fact that's how it long it took for them to really pacify india that's again something to be remembered india was not conquered in a jiffy there was a lot of resistance but after that pacification was done then from the middle of the 19th century as we see it essentially what the british were doing in india was exercising their power legitimizing their rule by spreading ideas about themselves and about their rule which had twin objectives one the objective was to make people in india believe that british rule was actually good for them you know there was in hindi the term used to be uh, british raj ki barkatein the benefits of british rule this was a essential chapter in every history book which the children uh, in the government schools all over the country used to read so over the latter part of the 19th century from the 1850s onwards the focus in terms of keeping india under british control 
shifts from the use of force to essentially the use of ideas and institutions. Indians were told Britain is the most powerful country in the world and there was also therefore a greater demonstration of that sheer might. By talking about history, by talking about Britain, how Britannia ruled the seas, notions like the sun never set on the British Empire, all these were very popular commonplace notions during that time. And through all this, this, there was this, you could say, that the Indian mind was sought to be held in this kind of thrall. That one, we are good for you, and secondly, even if you don't think we are good for you, we're not going to get out that easily. We are very powerful. We are the most powerful nation in the world. So think twice before any resistance. There was no contradiction between those, these two ideas. They were simultaneously uh, you know, spread. So as we understand it, the basic task of the Indian national movement when it began to come into being from, and we date the Indian national movement not from the date of the founding of a organization that is the Indian National Congress from 1885, but we really look at it in terms of when the first nationalist ideas begin to emerge in the country. And if you look at that, then you could actually go back to about the late 1860s, when the first stirrings of such ideas become visible in the press. In fact, the press is the first place where these ideas uh, emerge. And of course, in the writings of people like Dadabhai Naroji, and then Ranade and R.C. Dath. I think 1857, again, that, that way was also a tremendous lesson for Indians. In a sense, that path of resistance, which Indians had followed in different ways, whether it was the rulers, or whether it was the chieftains, or whether it was peasants, demobilized soldiers, all of whom had come together in 1857, did see after the crushing of that revolt. It was a huge revolt. And huge sacrifices were made. Thousands and thousands of people were uh, killed in that. In Delhi alone, how many thousands of people were actually just hung uh, from the poles down Chandni Chowk, you know, to tell the Indians that, you know, this is not going to be allowed. So after that, when they begin to seek a different path of resistance, then essentially it's a battle of ideas. So in fact, the engagement with ideas and pulling the British into arguments and into contest on the ideological trade terrain in which Gandhi was the great master was also a way of bringing the battle onto a terrain in which you were not unequal to your opponent. The British had no great superiority if it came to a battle for ideas, but they certainly had a great superiority if it was a question of contest of physical force. The many groups in India kept trying over the next hundred years inspired by examples of armed struggle to try and raise a little army here or a little resistance there, but basically found at the time that it was not really possible. Bhagat Singh too, who was one of the most important representatives of this trend who believed that some use of force, though his main emphasis in fact of the use of force and violence was to arouse the consciousness of the people. But even he came to the conclusion towards the end of his life that what you really needed was a mass movement from, as I said, the 1860s onwards, and this continues right into the 1920s and the 1930s, when new ideas, radical ideas, socialist ideas, all kinds of ideas keep uh, nurturing and keep strengthening and keep uh, flowing into this uh, stream. But what you get, and it, as I said, this is quite unique, you get a very high level of original ideas of all kinds that you find in the national movement. All the best minds of the period of the freedom struggle, whether they were in science or whether they were in arts or whether they were in literature, all got attracted towards this movement. There must have been something quite remarkable about it when we're talking about the legacy. It's not the legacy of the freedom struggle is not just in one thing. It's not just a legacy of nationalism. It's not just a le legacy of giving us back our national pride, which of course it was, you know. but. It was much more than that. There's a whole, uh, there's a whole variety. There's, in, in a sense, an, an explosion of ideas in that legacy that Dada Bhai Naroji, Ranade, Gokhale, and R. C. Dutt, their economic writings, in fact, were the first place where the where colonialism as a system began to be understood in the world. They don't write in a theoretical way. Their method is different. They look at the empirical reality. They analyze it. They look at the data. They take the statistics of the British. Dada Bhai Naroji's work on the poverty 
of the Indian peasant on the drain of wealth. RC that's work on the land revenue system. Even today we use Economic History of India, Volume 1 and 2, written by R.C. Dutt, as our basic economic history text for the uh, colonial period. He wrote in 1901 his famous open letter to the Viceroy, to Lord Curzon, in which, giving data and giving his analysis, he said that land revenue that was extracted was always much more than what the criteria was. And as a result of his open letter, open letter means it was in the press, Actually, because of his intervention, one of the most basic changes in British policy took place, where the government, Lord Curzon himself, one of the most conservative viceroys, passed an order, which was then operative throughout India, that land revenue could not be more than 25% of the peasants' assets. As far as the early period is concerned, the pe people that we call uh, the moderates, there is absolutely uh, there, there's, there's no room for any doubt about their absolutely clear secular uh, credentials. They do not at any point imagine that this is a homogeneous country, that you can actually get people together onto a national movement on the basis of emphasizing one language, one culture, one religion, or anything like that. They are extremely conscious. They are deeply conscious of the extreme variety extreme diversity and therefore the concept with which they work is not that of an Indian nation but that of a nation in the making. I'll give you two examples uh, of this. One, you probably have heard the name of Ranade. Ranade was again one of the very early uh, leaders. Very interestingly, he had made a proposal that uh, the session of the social reform uh, conference, All India Social Conference, should be held uh, along with or just after the annual session of the Indian National Congress. Then this would mean that it would become an issue. It would be something which would divide the people who were coming together as the Congress. And they said that no issue should be brought into the discussions of the National Congress, which was divisive. Rarade himself was a very important leader, was quite upset about it. But in the interest of maintaining unity, and even if 10% of people go away from this movement, this is not something we can afford. So that all policies must be one which bring people together. But they can bring people together only if you respect their sentiments. Again, very interestingly, not even race. You would imagine that given the fact that racial discrimination was quite strong, and especially in the second half of the 19th century, racial difference between Indians and Britain's social distance had become quite pronounced. There was that famous Ilbert Bill controversy in which, the, in, in a sense, the white... Uh, people had ganged up together and said, we will not agree to be tried uh, by an Indian, etc. So this racial sentiment was quite high. And yet you do not find in the Indian National Congress any attempt to use race as a galvanizing factor. We are brown, they are white, they are foreign, we are indigenous. You know, all these kinds of uh, otherwise emotive issues are kept out. And certainly religion is something that is kept out. Interestingly, the primary emphasis on setting up the whole basis of nationalism in India is economic. The entire liberal democratic discourse, which was dominant in Britain at that time, you know, was appropriated by the Indian nationalist leaders and turned against the British. But these people began to be able to see through and they were able to then stand these ideas on its head. And in that, one of the basic notions was that, that India had to have a secular foundation. There was no question in their mind. I mean, there was never any doubt. This is what is remarkable. In the early years, from 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, if you look at these 30, 40 years of the foundation years of the national movement in terms of ideas, you know, there is not even a debate. I think that's remarkable. There is not a single nationalist thinker who says the future India which when we become independent has to be a Hindu India. When we come to what is known as the extremist uh, period, and I must tell you that in the latest history books which the NCRT has uh, issued, the term extremist has been abolished. So, you know, it's like if I was a French woman and uh, somebody suddenly wrote, started, uh, wrote a history of the French Revolution in which they decided that the term Jacobin is no longer in existence. It's a historical term. I mean, it's not a term that you and I gave it. It's not a term given by historians. It's a term given to us by history. You know, 
I can't just turn around and say I won't call the moguls moguls. You know, because moguls are have a bad word in you know, or maybe in somewhere where moguls were very oppressive. Moguls is a very bad word. How can I call the moguls moguls? I'll call them something else. You know, I mean, it's as absurd as that. Very interestingly, the entire foundational period of the national movement has been wiped out of existence in the school uh, NCRT history uh, textbook. And I think that's terrible. And what do they do? Then they come to what is called the extremist period and again, completely distort this extremist period. Call it cultural nationalism. So Indian nationalism emerges to the student in the school history uh, textbook today in the form of cultural nationalism. Economic nationalism, which as I just told you, was the foundation of Indian nationalism. It was quite remarkable again that way, that, the, I, that I, can, I think one can assert it again and again without any uh, fear of being contradicted, that the foundation of Indian nationalism was an economic nationalism, foundation. Then comes the political, the social, the cultural aspects. You know. Here it's completely overturned. The foundation of Indian nationalism is sought to be found in what they call cultural nationalism. And culture, of course, is very easily translatable into Hindu. Leave the word culture, substitute for it Hindu, and Indian nationalism becomes Hindu nationalism. No? So the attempt is to portray that from the very beginning, Indian nationalism was nothing but Hindu nationalism. And then you, of course, distort. You portray Lokmanya Tilak, Aurobindo, Bipin Chandra Pal, all these leaders of the extremists as being some kind of Hindu chauvinists or Hindu communalists. In this period, Indian nationalism is struggling to reach beyond the confines of the middle classes and the professional classes. When it is trying to reach out to the people, whether it is in the Swadeshi movement in Bengal, or whether it is in uh, Maharashtra, uh, Tilak, or whether it is in Punjab, or whether it is in Tamil Nadu, you know, once you are trying to reach out to the people, certain aspects of popular culture, which inevitably overlap with religion, religious traditions are bound to come into the political sphere. How do you talk to people in an idiom which they understand? This is a problem that Gandhi faced. He had to evolve an idiom which common people could understand. What was Gandhiji's concept of Ram Raj and how did people understand it? Did the people of India understand his concept of Ram Raj as Hindu Raj? Was it equal to Hindu Raj? Or did they understand it in the way in which he put it forward and in which it is popularly understood in Indian uh, uh, cultural uh, idiom as a term which is used for saying just rule, good rule, you know, as the opposite of the despotic British rule, we want Ram Raj. Ram Raj is an ideal Raj. The legacy of the freedom struggle is a completely secular uh, legacy of all wings of the freedom struggle. In fact, that's what's I think very interesting. Those who were in the freedom struggle, those who actually fought the battles of the freedom struggle, whether they were congressmen, whether they were Akalis, whether they were revolutionary terrorists, whether they were the uh, red shirts of uh, uh, Badshah Khan, you know, there are so many different uh, groups also that come together in this freedom struggle. It is not just the Congress that we are talking about. If you look at all these diverse groups that fight the freedom struggle, none of them adopts a communal outlook. They are all firmly secular. That's very interesting. All the groups that were communal, at that time, were not in the freedom struggle. There was a basic contradiction between nationalism and communalism. If you were a nationalist, you could not be a communalist. So the conception of India that was formed by nationalists of all hues, you know, was one in which communalism had no place. I think it's extremely important to remember this. There is no such thing in the freedom struggle as Hindu nationalism. And I would urge all of you to not use that term when you're describing Hindu communalism. Call it communalism. Don't call it Hindu nationalism. Don't give them the benefit of being called nationalists. They are communalists, they are anti-nationalists. In India, commun the word communalism, the word communalist has been a synonym for anti-nationalist. And the opposite also, secularism in India is not just positive secularism in the sense the distance between religion and the state. Simultaneously, secularism in India has meant struggling against communal ideas, struggling against communalism. I don't think any of us can today sit down and say, I'm a secularist, but I'm not fighting against communalism. I think you would all immediately say, if I'm a secularist, then automatically I see myself as somebody who's resisting communal uh, ideas, communal politics, communal parties. Keep communalism a dirty word. Don't legitimize communalists. 
don't call them Hindu uh, nationalists, keep emphasizing the distance between nationalism and uh, communalism. Keep pointing out that communalism, in fact, is anti-national. Because anything that leads to the country not holding together, obviously, is anti-national. I mean, what is your first principle of nationalism? We can discuss everything else later, whether you're for economic development or not, whether you're for socialism, whether you're for public sector or private sector, everything. But first thing, everybody will have to agree that to be a nationalist, you must at least want that India hangs together. Policies which promote division among the people, policies which lead to terrorism, how could those people be called nationalists of any kind, Hindu or whatever? They are straightforward communalists, and we should call them by that uh, name and just not give them the label of uh, nationalists at all. I think one of the most important things is to continually question their nationalist credentials, whether in the past uh, or now. The Hindu Mahasabha, the RSS, or any of its sister uh, organizations did not participate in a single battle for freedom, neither as part of the broad national movement that is non-cooperation movement, civil disobedience movement, Quit India movements, Vadeshi movement. Give us one example, one example of any struggle in any part of India that was organized, led, and in which the participation was by the communal uh, forces, neither Hindu nor Muslim, nor the Sikh communalists af after they be became, you know, Akali movement in the early days is a very different movement. It's not a communal movement. It's an anti-British movement and it's for the liberation of the Gurudwaras. It's an anti-feudal movement. And those who are communalists inevitably end up also not, not even just being independent and separate and keeping a distance, but they end up being uh, loyalist. In terms of the struggle against communalism, we often uh, we look upon, and I think rightly so, as Jawaharlal Nehru in, in terms of the intellectual uh, formulations of so he was perhaps the first person who understood communalism deeply what in what communalism in India was about in fact he's the person who described communalism as the Indian form of fascism he said fascism in India will not come in the form in which it has come in Europe fascism in India will come in the form of communalism so he's the one who gave us the sensitivity that communalism is the Indian form of uh, fascism and so much else he's a lot of theoretical insights no doubt but Still, I find that Bhagat Singh had a very profound and very deep understanding of uh, communalism. He writes in his uh, Why I'm an Atheist, one of the last things which he wrote before his death, in which he said that, you know, I remain an atheist to the end. Communalism, he said, is a colonial ideology. You know, I don't think even Nehru goes so far as that, as to actually call it a colonial ideology, you know. What does that mean? If you say it's a colonial ideology, you mean that it is a, it is a sort of a structural constituent of colonialism in India. It's also become quite fashionable these days to say we should not overemphasize the role of uh, colonialism. After all, differences in India existed from before the British came. Hindus and Muslims have been two uh, separate religions. There were differences in the medieval period also. And all that happens under colonialism as these differences come to a... Uh, uh, greater, you know, come to acquire greater uh, importance. I don't think it's as simple as that. The existence of differences in any society is not equivalent to differences acquiring the form of people actually organizing themselves politically and then socially and culturally into hostile groups. After all, differences exist the world over. You know, we cannot solve these problems to act by solving them at the political realm alone. If the people are infected with communalism, your politics will get communalized. The politician will start catering to that. So to expect the vote-gathering politician to not cater to the ideas which are spread among the people is romantic. So we have to change the ideas in the minds of the people so that we also change what the politician has to uh, cater to. You know. That doesn't mean you're absolving politicians of responsibility, but I'm saying as citizens, you know, it's extremely important that this ideological struggle is uh, carried out. In Kali Sadiyo Kesar Se 
जब रात का चल ढलकेगा जब दुख के बादल पिघलेंगे जब सुख का सागर छलकेगा जब अंबर झूम के नाचेगा जब धरती नगमे गाएगी वो सुबह कभी तो आएगी वो सुबह कभी 